Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Friday, August 14th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Sunday will be a big day for baseball and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum located in the 18th and Vine District. The museum is celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Negro Leagues. It started in 1920 with the paper signed at the Paseo YMCA just around the corner from the museum. On Sunday, the anniversary will be part of every Major League game. Players, coaches, and umpires will wear special patches, and the logos will be part of the bases and the scorecards and on signage in the stadium. Museum President Bob Kendrick will be part of several baseball broadcasts on Sunday, including the Sunday night game between the Red Sox and Yankees on ESPN, and you'll hear him on today's episode talking about how the event came together. We also talk about the other ways the museum and the Negro Leagues have been honored and recognized this year. You may have noticed the Toyota commercial where the family's driving around Kansas City and stops at the museum and at a baseball game where the family patriarch is honored. That's a real former Kansas City Monarch star, by the way, and we'll tell you who he is. Also, former star pitcher CC Sabathia, a friend of the museum, has opened a clothing line to honor the Negro Leagues. Bob Kendrick tells you more about that. You know, it was in 1990 with a big push from former Kansas City Monarchs player and Kansas City icon Buck O'Neill that the museum opened. So it's also the 30th anniversary of this Kansas City treasure. Okay, so here we go with Bob Kendrick. But a couple things before we get started. Bob and I sat down in the lobby of the museum after closing hours on Wednesday. So you'll hear some other sounds besides us talking. Bob says goodbye to some folks leaving for the evening, for instance. But that's just Bob Kendrick being the good man that he is. Okay, so here we go. How did it get started? Well, the, the idea came to me last year that it would be fun to do a National Day of Recognition because this is unprecedented. You know, this is the first time ever Major League Baseball, all 30 Major League teams have honored the Negro Leagues. As you well know, there have always been certain teams. We've done annual salutes to the Negro Leagues here with the Royals and Pittsburgh and um, Detroit's big Detroit, on Detroit, because they, they all, you know, they all have very rich Negro Leagues history. My good friend Dave Winfield, for, for the better part of 10 years, did one in San Diego. Now, they did not have, you know, they had a team briefly. There was this failed West Coast League, but it was important to Dave. And Dave was able to get the other execs to come in, and he was able to raise the money and necessary to do it. He did a great salute. But this is the first time ever all 30 Major League teams have honored the Negro Leagues in a, in a kind of this national day of recognition, this national show of solidarity in and around the history of the Negro Leagues. And, and so, you know, this date was originally supposed to be June 27th. And so when we made the, when we had the commemoration ceremonies on February 13th, you know, it seems like eons ago now, well, we weren't, mar- we weren't wearing, we weren't these. wearing masks. And, you know, we're all in the Paseo YMCA. Yep. We had gone back into the building that gave birth to the story. 100 years, big, you know, 100 years exact to that day. You know, we announced then that it was going to be this National Day of Recognition. And, and so, to be honest, I thought that coronavirus had completely derailed this idea. I didn't think it was going to happen. And, and, and initially, I'll be honest, there was a part of me that didn't want to see it happen in an empty stadium. Right. But then as I, I started to think about this, and then as baseball started to, you know, as we brought, as baseball came back, MLB broached the idea with me, and it just made still great sense that we not allow, allow this milestone anniversary to go, to go bad without some meaningful celebration, even though there won't be fans in the stands. Right. We would have loved to have all these ballparks filled with fans and players and fans and everybody celebrating the Negro Leagues. But I think the TV audiences for these teams are probably going to be as high as any. And, and so we'll still make a meaningful impact. And, and like I said, even though it won't be with a sta- you know, it won't be fans in the stadium, it doesn't diminish the significance of what this day represents. You know, I, 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 after we were able to get this done initially, my first thoughts, obviously, as many of my thoughts as it relates to Negro Leagues does, goes back to Buck O'Neill. And, and Blair, when he started this project, he, he, he told me then, he said, 
you know, I want to do this because I want us to be remembered. Well, come Sunday, they're <laughs> being remembered. Yep. They, are, they are being remembered. And so this is really a watershed moment for Negro League's history and for this museum as the primary caretaker of this history. And so I, I, I'm tremendously proud that we were able to do this and that baseball and the Players Association very graciously embraced this notion, you know, when it was June 27th and then didn't walk away from the idea when baseball did come back. Mm -hmm. Right. right. You're, you, you make a good point that on Sunday, not only will players wear the patch, the Negro League's patch, it'll be on their sleeve. Is, is there, I think I write I yes. it right, uh -huh. on their sleeve. Yeah, you're right. Yes. There'll be images on the base, on that the bases. The bases and the throughout the stadium. Yeah, and probably on the, on the screens, on the jumbotrons, mm -hmm. that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Uh-huh, and so the TV messaging will be geared toward Negro Leagues. Lord knows I've done any number of interviews with ball clubs, and we even still have other programs that we're going to do with with some ball clubs. And so, yeah, and, and, it, and it does. It, it, I mean, I was so, hmm, when it became so evident what coronavirus had done, you know, it, it was a little bit, you know, I was dis, it, disheartened. Yeah. You know, but again, you kind of, you know, you, you, you can't wallow in self-pity. And, and it was still important that we figure out ways to salvage this celebration. And, and that's where the tip your cap idea came out of. And now this national day of recognition and the new apparel line with CC Sabathia and these kinds of things that have really kind of kept this milestone year out in front of people and you know we weren't able to do all the things and go all the places that we wanted to be and but the celebration is being it is still taking place in a very meaningful fashion i wanted to ask you about uh, a couple of those things the the cc sabathia clothing line mm -hmm. um I, for, I forgot what the hashtag was i'll, I'll have it for the story but uh, uh I, I did see his his uh, social media push on that last month and it's, it's donating amazing. all proceeds to uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's been amazing um, it's the first such collaboration that the museum has ever had with a even though he's a former major leaguer he's just barely removed from the league so this is the first kind of relationship you know marketing promotional relationship we've ever had with a player of that magnitude and for CC to basically champion this idea in conjunction with Major League Baseball's Players Association. And, and so this is our first collaborative effort, but I do think it's the first of many collaborative efforts that you'll see between the Negro Leagues Museum and the Players Association specifically. And, and that, that also signals a new direction, and, and that is in large part due again to Tony Clark who has been a longtime friend of mine and you know, obviously a staunch advocate for what the Negro Leagues represents and his place in this sport as it relates to the heritage of this sport. And, and so, yeah, we're looking at other potential opportunities, but this is the first one. And to have someone who is as well respected as CeCe, CeCe's been a longtime friend of mine and the museum. You know, he started coming here when he was with the Cleveland Indians and he was one of the few major league athletes that would make pretty much an annual stop by here. So again, he understands his place in this sport. And so the Negro Leagues, once he was introduced to the Negro Leagues, it grabbed hold of him. And it's something that is in his heart. And so he had an opportunity to do something, you know, that is actually, you know, it's very cool, it's cutting edge, and it's introducing the Negro Leagues to an audience that maybe had not thought about the Negro Leagues, you know, right. prior. Right. Mm -hmm. That stuff is pretty stylish that he's it's selling. Really, yeah. <laughs> and they're selling a ton of it right now. And, you know, keep selling it, man. <laughs> uh, it got me thinking, you know, um, the museum may be the, the best thing that the Players Association and Major League Baseball have in common right now. <laughs> well, you know, there haven't been many areas of common ground. And, and so it is kind of, 
gratifying to see that the museum has become that one common piece. You know, we, we've kind of, the winning spirit of the Negro Leagues continues to bring people together. And, and so that, that means a lot too. Good night, y'all. That, that means a lot too, you know, and I think it's something that, again, that they have really embraced, both, both sides. You know, I had the opportunity to tour Commissioner Manfred uh, when he first got the job the year that he came out for the World Series. And I didn't have to twist his arm to come visit the Negro Leagues Museum. He and his wife came and they, they spent nearly two hours here with me walking through the museum. And then Tony becomes the head of the Players Association. And so the stars kind of align with two people who get it. They, they understand the significance of what this history represents and that it can be a vehicle as they continue to find ways to get urban kids engaged and involved. And to do that, you have to understand what your place is in this, in, in this sport. And, and so the Negro Leagues plays a very important part. Negro Leagues baseball will help Major League Baseball become better. And, and this history is there as a testament to those who overcame tremendous adversity to play this game. Um, you know, another uh, player who I know that has a, an affection for this place, and I think I was here the day he stepped in here for the first time, was Andrew McCutcheon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now he's promoting with the Buffalo. Yeah, no, no, and we're going to do some other stuff, too, because he was so good. He's <laughs> a natural at this thing, man. And, and so, no, we you know, uh, Kutch has been great. You know, this means something to him. And, and, and it should. It should. I tell people all the time, Blair, if you are of African-American or Hispanic descent, this is your mecca. Yeah, yeah, you don't play this game had it not been for the players in Negro Leagues. And, and, and there is no and, if, buts about it. It doesn't happen. And, and so if, if you are to fully embrace what you do in your place in this sport, you have to pay honor to the Negro Leagues and players like CeCe Sabathia and Andrew McCutcheon and, and others, they get it. They get it. And hopefully through them, the young players coming into our league will also get it. You know, and, and so, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, you know, it's great to have these guys. It, you know, it reminds me back in my early years with the museum when it was Tory Hunter and Jock Jones and Latroy Hawkins, you know, the first group of young players to really embrace the museum. And guys like Mike Jackson, who was kind of the elder statesman yep. at that time, brought them here. You know, it was almost like he was taking them under their wing, under his wing, and saying, hey, you know, you need to be here. And then they started coming every year, that they were all playing together and Subsequently, even as they started to move to other teams when travel brought them here, same thing with Curtis Granderson. You know, but there's also something, you know, you can see that there's a common bond. These are players who are very astute players who understand the significance of their heritage in this game. So you didn't have to twist their arm. You didn't have to sell them on this. You know, they wanted to do this and they wanted to be a part of it. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. You know, another, uh, another way that, uh, that the, the museum is being celebrated this year is the Toyota commercial. Mm -hmm. how, how cool is that? It was very cool. We shot that commercial in November, uh, last November. And uh, 
I'm so happy because it has made former Kansas City Monarch Jim Robinson kind of an overnight star <laughs> at age 90. And, and so, you know, I'm so I'm thrilled. I'm going to do something in there. I'm so thrilled that he now gets to see himself as a TV star. And the, and the spot is so beautifully shot. Hell, you almost forget that it's a car commercial. <laughs> but the agency that shot it, they spent a couple of days here with us back last November. And uh, they had this idea and they brought Mr. Robinson to town. He's 90 years young. And, uh, but it's also raised the profile of the museum, the centennial celebration. And, and again, I think it also sends a, a resounding message when you see the museum associated with a, a major brand like Toyota and a major brand like Bank of America. Uh, it also signals, uh, hopefully, the, you know, the, the path that we're charting as well. And, and so, you know, like I said, while much was lost to coronavirus, we've also gained a lot. We've been able to seize the moment you know, even if it wasn't, like I say, an, an ideal set of circumstances. Well, I wanted to ask you if, um, if the, the, the awareness of social justice mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. of this summer mm-hmm. has played a role in, in raising awareness of the museum. Oh, it absolutely has. How so? It, it, it absolutely has. Because what has it done? And, 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 and in, all, in all earnest, if I'm going to take any solace out of what has come out of what has been a very tumultuous set of circumstances in our country, it is the fact that people started to recognize and embrace the notion that this museum is a social justice museum. It is a civil rights museum. It is just seen through the lens of baseball. And so from you know, from my involvement with the incredible forum that you guys put together to having done, moderated the discussion with the Major League Baseball players that we did, people are turning to the museum for thought leadership. And and that's exactly what we wanted to happen. You know, this museum is 30 years old this year. And when we built this museum, Blair, it was all about building a great attraction because we wanted to grab hold of the imagination of people so that they would come and be introduced to the story. But the entire journey was about building a great institution. And so it was with the mindset that whenever there were conversations in particular around race and sports, they should happen here. This is where they should emanate. And, and so the fact that people have kind of grasped that, and uh, you know, I've been involved since the last time that we were all together on that, that virtual call, I've probably done five, six different diversity inclusion pieces in and around the Negro Leagues. It's a perfect platform to talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. And, and so, yeah, that heightened awareness in and around social justice has, I think, substantiated even more so the value of a Negro Leagues baseball museum. Well, that's, um, I thought it might, mm-hmm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and it should. Yeah, um, yeah, because that's what this is. Yeah, that's, that's, what that, that's, that's exactly what this is. I think when, when I tour the museum and I stop, one of my favorite, the, I enjoy seeing everything and reading everything, but one of my favorite depictions in there is the, uh, just the, the, where you have the, the mannequins of players in their dress suits, yes, you, yes, you know, in their, yes, this is yes, how they live, this is yes, how they travel, yes. and, uh, and it really kind of brings it home, this is what, uh, this is what life was like in the, in the 30s or 40s, yes. you know, for, for them. Yeah. Um, uh, it is, it's really well done, and, and um, uh, it was a great idea to, to, uh, to well, include that. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to create lifestyle. We wanted people to not only see what it was like as these athletes were traveling the highways and byways of our country, enduring the social adversity that they had to endure to play the game, but we also wanted them to see what these communities that were so greatly impacted by Negro Leagues baseball was also like. You know, and so all of this wasn't downtrodden. 
You know, uh, as a matter of fact, in many cases, it was majestic. You know, the, 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 the places and the places that they had, you know, these black restaurants and these black owned hotels and the nightclubs that became so, you know, these places were jumping. And, and so you needed to see that. And that's what I talk about, even as we talk about these efforts in and around civil rights and social injustice, it's important that if you're going to understand the black experience in this country, I don't want your only image of me to be the, that, that downtrodden side of me where I was sprayed by water hoses and the dogs are released on me and the police brutality, which unfortunately has still continued to manifest itself through time. I don't want that to be the only image that you see of me. You also need to see my success stories. And the Negro Leagues is one of those great success stories. Yeah, it's that triumph over that adversity. Of course, one of the um, uh, one of the casualties of a of a shortened baseball season, and then the the circumstances that we have in this baseball season is perhaps teams that come to Kansas City can't, can't come, can't visit the the museum. That's those are the times when it hurts. Yeah, when my good friend Joe Castiglione, who comes every year and brings guys from the Boston Red Sox. And, 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 and they don't get to come to town. Or uh, the Seattle Mariners who have 10 African-American ball players. You know, I don't know the last time a major league team had 10 African-American ball Spe- players. Especially this day and age. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, you know, we're talking probably maybe Pittsburgh Pirates, Pirates in the 70s. Pirates in the 60s and 70s, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. The Royals were close yep. in, in the in 70s. 70s. 70s, uh-huh. And, and they've got 10. And, and Dave Sims, who's a good friend of mine, uh, was excited about bringing them here. And the fact that this 100th anniversary would have been even more fuel for more players to come visit the museum, that saddens me. It does, because I look forward to that. And, and, and it never gets old. You know, you want to see their reaction to the stories and you want to share those stories and try to bring it to life for them so that they can understand it and hopefully appreciate it and you know and i think gain a perspective so yeah you're right you know those opportunities are missed opportunities hopefully we'll be able to regain that next year Uh, a lot of the big celebratory events that we had planned we're going to roll them into 2021 And, and so again hopefully the fact that we've been able to salvage some of this this celebration will just kind of energize people even more when baseball returns next year and we're able to literally move into this Negro Leagues 101 mode, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, we're always thinking ahead, man. You know, we... Yeah. <laughs> All right, so where, where are you going to be on Sunday? You know, I'm going to be at home because I'm going to be doing a lot of interviews. I'll probably spend some time here as well. But, you know, I was just looking at my calendar. I think as many as five to six interview requests have already been on the, on, on the books, uh, including uh, the Sunday night baseball. Uh, I, think, I think it's Yankees, Red Yankees, Sox. Yankees, Red Sox. Yeah. And uh, so doing some stuff with MLB uh, Network, doing some stuff with some of the regional networks. Of course, the Royals. Um, we're going to do baseball tonight. And so they're going to be a great opportunity for exposure for the museum and and so and we're seeing that it's been that way for the last several weeks actually yeah yeah you know beautiful piece in the la times on sunday i saw that yeah Did a really you know, nice job with that yeah you know and again i mean you know you think about what has happened with the museum over the last month you know major articles in the washington post new york times la times as you well know that stuff doesn't happen by happenstance man you know and, and, and honestly people pay a lot of money to get that to happen. And, and so, <laughs> so I'm glad we could give them something that we could sell because we ain't have no money. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's, it, it was, uh, I did, they, they've all been great. I've, I've read them and. Um, I'm going to do something in there. So, anyway. All right, Bob. That's a good one to leave it on. I appreciate you. I appreciate you sitting here and talking to me about all this. No, man. It's, you know, it's exciting. Like I said, you know, it's um, you know, we when we went into this year, came into this year, 
you know, we had this great game plan and you know, we were going to do all these exciting things, be in all these different places. Little did we know 30 days after we made the announcement that everything would come to a crashing halt. And, and so again, but you know, as I tell people all the time, this museum, it kind of embodies the spirit of the Negro League. The story of the Negro Leagues is about resiliency. This museum has to basically demonstrate that same spirit. You know, and that's what we're trying to do. And so we're going to make the best out of what has been a difficult situation for everybody, not just us, for everybody in this country. And, and hopefully give people something too that they can rally around. You know, we need that. I think that's why the tip your cap to the tip your cap to the Negro Leagues really resonated with so many people. We needed that. You know, we really did. At that time when we were dealing with so much uncertainty in this world from a health standpoint and from a social justice standpoint, we needed something that we could all feel good about. And, and so when we introduced Tip Your Cap, people just embraced the notion. And again, it goes back to that winning spirit of the Negro Leagues, bringing people together. That'll do it for today and this week on Sportsbeat KC. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. You can read about the Negro Leagues Museum on KansasCity.com, and we'll post a story in the show notes as well. Hey, earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about the Sports Pass offer, and still stands, and still a good one, 30 bucks for a year's worth of sports coverage. That includes the Sports Extra that comes with the E-Edition. There's more than 40 additional pages of national sports coverage today. An even better offer? Buy the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus some extra news, sports, and business coverage that come with the E-Edition. The details at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. That's account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And whether it's the sports pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Monday with a new episode.